right. Thanks very much, Paul. And um, thanks to everyone for having me here. Unlike the folks who've gone before, I'm actually going to be reading off this, partly because I um, don't study CRISPR as my um, you know, primary job, and I want to make sure I get everything technically correct, but also because I just flew in from California, which is nine hours earlier, and I've discovered that with jet lag, if I don't read off this, everything just tends to go out the window. So, <laughs> um, All right. Well, uh, as Paul said, I'll be um, talking today about the gene editing technology CRISPR, um, and I'm going to be talking from the 3,000 meter view. So. Um, at that level, when people sort of ask me about um, CRISPR, what they usually want to know are three things. How does it work? What can we do with it? And should I be afraid? Um, so I'm going to answer all those questions. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about how CRISPR came to be. So uh, here's the story. So since around 1970, scientists had known about a mysterious pattern that showed up in the DNA of nearly every kind of bacteria. And it looked roughly like this. Um, there would be a stretch of DNA that was a palindrome. It read the same um, forwards and backwards. And there would be a stretch of what looked like junk, and then another palindrome, and so on. And when they first discovered this pattern, scientists decided to name it CRISPR, which was short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Um, don't worry about remembering that, but CRISPR. Um, but they still had no idea what it did. In 2006, a guy named um, Rudolf Baranjou was working for a company called Danisco, which supplies bacterial cultures for the yogurt and cheese industries. And so they have vats and vats and vats of the bacteria you need to make blue cheese or camembert or Greek yogurt. And as the person responsible for growing these bacteria, Baranjou was very concerned for their health. Um, and something not a lot of people know is that viruses make bacteria sick just like they make people sick. And at an industrial scale, that can be a real problem. Um, every now and then, Baranjou would lose a whole colony of really wonderful cheese bacteria to a virus. So that year, um, Baranjou made a discovery. He figured out that this mysterious pattern, known as CRISPR, was actually a bacterial immune system. So those identical palindromes that had looked so striking were really just dividers, like you'd find in a file cabinet. Um, and the stretches that had looked like junk were actually bits of virus DNA. So together, they were a record of every virus that the bacterium had been exposed to. Now, for Baranjou, this discovery was very exciting because these immune systems could be transplanted from one kind of bacteria to another, so it meant that he could effectively inoculate his cultures against all kinds of viruses. And in fact, one of the first things he did was take the best and most robust immune system he could find and put it into his favorite yogurt culture to make it extremely healthy. Um, for the rest of the world, though, the ability to make disease-resistant cheese bacteria wasn't the most in-demand technology. Uh, so fortunately for us, not long after, a group of scientists in Berkeley and Switzerland made another discovery. And that group was led by the geneticists Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And what they wanted to know was how CRISPR could snip out a very precise stretch of virus DNA and then insert it into its own file in the CRISPR gene. So I'm not going to get too technical here, but what they figured out was that CRISPR had two key parts. Um, the first part was a protein known as Cas9 that acted like a scissors, snipping the two strands of the DNA helix. That's why you'll often see CRISPR referred to by its full name, CRISPR-Cas9. Um, the second part was something called a guide RNA, which directed where exactly in the gene or genome the scissors cut. And there's actually a third little part that locks the scissors in place, but don't worry about that. Um, anyway, after the cuts had been made and a new piece of um, DNA added to the file, um, a natural genetic repair mechanism automatically stitched the whole thing back together. So once they figured this out, um, Doudna and Charpentier had a brilliant idea. What if they could take this system and turn it into something that we could use to edit genes? And initially, they didn't have a lot of hope for this because it had been tried before. Um, but when they tried it, it took about six months, and the tool they ended up creating, known as CRISPR, um, a little confusingly, also known as CRISPR, not only worked, it blew every existing gene technology out of the water. So before CRISPR, engineering a mouse with a single mutation took a dedicated lab almost two years, usually. Um, with CRISPR, it can take as little as two days. Uh, it's basically like having a word processor for gene editing. So to edit a gene using CRISPR, all you do is give the guide RNA an address corresponding to a particular location on the genome, the scissors will then snip out the selected gene, or even just a single base pair within a gene, and insert a replacement if needed. OK, so one thing, CRISPR is faster. 
That's not the only reason it's revolutionary, though. Something um, probably everyone in this room realizes, um, but not a lot of lay people do, is that before CRISPR, gene editing was really messy. Um, for instance, there was no guarantee that an edited gene would end up in the right place. So it was like trying to cut a paragraph out of a document, only to have your word processor paste the paragraph back in a random location. Um, and there were other problems. You might end up with no copies of a gene in one cell and a dozen copies in the cell next door. So needless to say, this was not ideal. Um, and one scientist told me that before CRISPR, he had to micro-inject roughly a million cells in order to get a single perfect mutation. And with CRISPR, he could get the same result using just 10 cells. So it was an extraordinary improvement. Um, the other thing that made CRISPR revolutionary was that it worked in almost every animal, from silkworms to monkeys, and also in almost every cell type. Kidney cells, heart cells, you name it. So I'm going to click forward so you can take a bit of a look at this. Um, and this was a big deal because our previous gene editing techniques, some of them simply didn't work in a lot of stuff. Um, you know, and that's part of why we had so many studies in mice, because mice were the, one of the few things we could genetically engineer, and most things were just simply too hard. And even rats were hard for reasons nobody really understands. Um, and while mouse studies are extremely useful, in the end, mice aren't that similar to people, especially when it comes to certain diseases, um, like brain diseases, like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's. And so that's why you also hear about all these wonderful drugs that cure cancer in mice or double the lifespan in mice. Finally, one last thing that CRISPR changed was how many genes we could edit at once. So before CRISPR, scientists could edit only a single gene at a time, and that took two years. With CRISPR, um, depending on the circumstance, but we can now, at least in some cases, edit dozens of genes simultaneously. And this is important because most diseases are not caused by a single mutation in a single gene, but by many different genes in combination. OK, so that's a brief summary of how CRISPR works and why it's so powerful, which brings us to part two of our discussion, which is what extraordinary new things is this technology going to allow us to do? OK, so first I should point out, CRISPR is still a very new technology. It's only been around for about three years. So we probably won't see its real impact for another five or 10 years. Uh, that said, even in three years, the promise of CRISPR has really been borne out. And that's especially true in medicine. So just to give you a few examples. I'll click through this. All right. So first, something that's been in the news a lot. Um, I don't think it's, it may not ultimately be the fastest moving um, most influential piece at the start, but certainly the, the most newsworthy has been gene therapy. Um, and the idea behind gene therapy is that you take a small number of defective cells from a patient, blood cells or kidney cells or what have you. You use CRISPR to fix the problematic mutation, multiply the repaired cells in a Petri dish, and infuse the now repaired cells back into the body. Um, and at the moment, this is being done um, mostly for what are known as monogenic diseases, things that are caused by a single typo in the genetic code. Um, but it's still quite a big deal. And in fact, the first human trials of CRISPR-based gene therapies are going to start this year, if they haven't already, for sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, which is a blood disorder, and retinal dystrophy, which causes blindness. Um, but beyond this sort of treatment, CRISPR has done something else, which is it's radically accelerated our ability to understand and study the underlying genetics of disease. So for instance, it was until recently, it was essentially impossible to do genetic engineering in T cells, which are cru a crucial part of our immune response. And with CRISPR, we can do that, which means we might finally be able to get a handle on conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes. It also means that we can finally begin to explore the genetic roots of complex diseases like autism and schizophrenia, which are thought to be caused by the interplay of dozens of genes and a rotating cast of dozens of genes. And this is literally something we couldn't study before CRISPR, since we could only edit a single gene at a time. Um, and my understanding is that even now, the Broad Institute has folks um, in China where they're doing the most advanced production of um, primate studies um, to work on this. So they're breeding monkeys that have you know, some of the genes that contribute to autism, for instance. OK. Finally, one of CRISPR's biggest impacts will actually will likely be in um, drug development, at least on the medical side. And that's because pharmaceuticals are often designed to correct for something a gene is doing wrong, like making a protein that raises your cholesterol. And the hard part has always been figuring out which genes matter the most to a particular disease. Um, and so to figure that out, researchers often conduct what's called a genome-wide association study. And I know someone here is going to be speaking about that. Um, 
And that means they sequence the genomes of a big batch of people who have a disease and look to see which genetic variations they have in common. All right? And it's a great approach. Um, the only complication is that there's so much natural genetic variation in people that it can be very hard to tell which of the hundreds of overlapping mutations are actually the important ones. Um, and so before CRISPR, it would have taken decades to genetically engineer and test each of these variants. And now using CRISPR, we can very quickly figure out what each variant does and which ones are potentially important targets for medication. OK, so there's a few examples of how CRISPR is changing the future of medicine. Uh, and that alone would be pretty exceptional. Um, but it's also impacting a lot of industries. So, in fact, Jennifer Doudna has said that she thinks one of CRISPR's biggest impacts, um, at least initially, may be in agriculture. Um, so one problem that researchers are currently trying to solve is how we feed 10 billion people in 2050 using roughly the same amount of land as we do now and given climate change. Uh, and one example might be something that people are working on, which is genetically engineering cassava, which is a staple crop for about 800 million people. And, um, but cassava contains cyanide, and so it has to be very carefully processed in order to be edible. Um, and so using CRISPR, researchers are um, figuring out how to silence um, the genes responsible for the cyanide production. Right? So that would be kind of an extraordinary improvement. They're also using it to make crops that are pest and drought resistant or that are more nutritious um, without using uh, GMOs, which here I'm defining as introduction of a foreign gene not just manipulation of the native genome. Um, and it can be used on livestock to create leaner, more protein-rich meat, and also to prevent disease. So another thing that researchers recently figured out was a way to create CRISPRized pigs that are resistant to swine fever. Um, and that's a disease that's been ruinous for farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. All right, and besides agriculture, very quickly, CRISPR is being used for a whole slew of other things. Um, it's being used to improve the cellular factories that make biofuels. In one case, a fairly simple change doubled the amount of fuel generated by a particular algae. Um, it's also being used in dish soaps and laundry detergents to engineer new enzymes that break down grease and make clothes soft. <laughs> and I've even heard that, um, I have read this one place, that people are using CRISPR to breed horses that can run faster and jump higher. I haven't been able to confirm if this is true, but if anybody knows about it, I'm very curious. Um, taken all together, though, the market for genetically engineered products is expected to double in the next three years to roughly $4 billion. Which brings us to um, part three of our talk, the final part. Should I be worried about this? <laughs> all right, so the answer to this question is obviously quite complicated, given the way, all the ways that CRISPR is being used. Um, but I do want to address a few key issues. So first, when it comes to the use of CRISPR on people, um, one of the main concerns that comes up a lot, especially um, in the media, uh, has been germline editing, um, which is when scientists edit the DNA of an embryo. And unlike gene therapy, um, it's distinct from that, any change made to an embryo would be heritable. It would be in you, it would be in your children, it would be in your grandchildren. Um, and there are a couple concerns about this, but one, is that this would create um, a kind of an intense genetic class divide where the wealthy would be able to pay, for instance, to increase their child's intelligence or athletic ability or appearance, um, or arguably more legitimately, simply to reduce their risk of developing Alzheimer's. Um, it's a very interesting ethical debate to have, but I also want to be clear that in practice, this is still probably quite far off. Uh, so far, scientists have successfully edited a human embryo to re remove a disease-causing mutation, um, but no edited embryo has yet been brought to term. And the idea of optimizing an embryo, for instance, to make a child that's more intelligent, is really far out. And that's partly because we don't understand the genetic factors behind intelligence very well, but also because in most cases, we don't know what else would happen if we changed a given gene. You know, in some cases, crucial biological processes might just collapse. Um, so this is not something we're likely to see in the next few years Probably. Again, if any expert in the room knows differently, please talk to me. <laughs> I'd be very curious to know. Um, when it comes to all the industrial applications, it goes without saying that there are going to be um, a bunch of policy implications. And one of the big questions, which I think will be taken up at this conference, is the question of whether CRISPRized crops and livestock should be regulated the way that some countries regulate what we currently call GMOs. Um, and as of January, both the European Court of Justice and the U.S. Department of Agriculture 
hinted that they did not intend to regulate crops that had been modified using CRISPR um, because the plants would be sort of genetically identical um, to ones that had been made using traditional crossbreeding, um, unlike GMOs, which you know, involve introducing a foreign gene. But the dis discussion is still very much ongoing, so we'll see what happens there. And finally, one important thing about CRISPR, which is both an advantage and a concern, is how easy it is to use. So to be clear, at this point, you know, we're not talking about a technology that's easy to use if you're a guy off the street. Um, it's more like if you're a student in a lab. But that still means that a lot more people can do gene editing. And that trend is probably only going to continue. So whether we want to stop that at this point is probably moot. Um, the genie is sort of out of the bottle. Uh, and as to whether we should be worried about it, honestly, that's harder to predict. Um, you know, an American defense agency recently invested about $65 million to study uh, whether CRISPR could potentially be used to create new biological weapons um, with the goal of, in theory, creating counterprotections, they say, um, as opposed to <laughs> offensive efforts, but it's something we'll need to keep an eye on. Um, and speaking of things that we want to keep an eye on, um, there's one last thing I want to talk about, uh, and that's a CRISPR-based tool um, that has the power to radically reshape our world for better or worse, and that's something called a gene drive. This is my particular interest. So um, many of you will have heard of gene drives, but for those who haven't, um, very briefly, a gene drive is a tool that drives, <laughs> drives a genetic change through a population. Um, so if you have a bunch of mosquitoes with uh, white eyes and you want all their offspring to have red eyes instead, a gene drive will let you do that. So it basically guarantees that a particular trait will be inherited. It sort of upsets Mendelian inheritance that would only have it at 50% and just makes the trait 100% heritable. So people had been trying to develop gene drive technology for decades in hopes that it could be used to eliminate malaria. But until quite recently, they hadn't had any success. Um, and the key development came when a biologist at Harvard figured out that it was possible to use CRISPR recursively. So he made it so that CRISPR would insert not only a new or edited gene, but also the CRISPR machinery itself, um, the stuff that does the cutting and pasting. So it was basically like designing a 3D printer that could make more 3D printers. Right? Um, so what does this mean? OK, so the good news is that this opens the door to some remarkable things. So if you put an anti-malarial gene drive in just 1% of Anopheles mosquitoes, which is the species that transmits malaria, um, researchers estimate that it could spread to the entire population in a year. So in a year, in theory at least, we could virtually eliminate malaria. Um, and the same goes for dengue fever, um, chikungunya, and yellow fever. Uh, and there's a second potential application. Say you want to get rid of an invasive species, like get all the Asian carp out of European rivers. Um, all you have to do is release a gene drive that makes the fish produce only male offspring. In a few generations, there'd be no females left, no more carp. So in theory, this means we could restore hundreds of native species that have been pushed to the brink. OK, so those are a couple examples of the good news. Uh, here's the bad news. <laughs> um, so gene drives are so effective that even an accidental release um, could potentially change an entire species very quickly. And it's also true that if a dozen Asian carp, say, with that all-male gene drive, accidentally or deliberately got carried from Europe back to Asia, they could potentially wipe out the native Asian carp population. And that's not particularly unlikely given how connected our world is, right? It's, in fact, why we have an invasive species problem in the first place. Um, and that's fish, right? It's even worse with things like mosquitoes and fruit flies because there's literally no way to contain them. Um, they cross borders and oceans all the time, right? Um, the other issue is that a gene drive might not stay confined to what we call the target species. And that's because of something called horizontal gene transfer, which is basically a fancy way of saying that neighboring species sometimes interbreed. Uh, and if that happens, it's possible that a gene drive could cross over, like Asian carp could infect some other kind of carp. And that's not so bad if your gene drive just promotes a trait like eye color. Um, but it could be a disaster if your drive is designed to eliminate the species entirely. So I'm guessing this sounds a little frightening, and that is true. Um, gene drives do at least also have limitations, so I want to lay those out. One is that they work only in sexually reproducing species, so they can't be used on viruses or bacteria, though CRISPR as an editing tool can. Um, also, the trait spreads only with each successive generation, so changing or eliminating a population is practical only if that species has a fast reproductive cycle, like insects or some small vertebrates. 
Um, and elephants are people it would take centuries for a trait to spread widely, so we don't have to worry about, everyone's always like, what's gonna happen to the human race now? And it's like, nothing. <laughs> we would just not, we would just stop it. Um, the other good news is that even now, scientists are worried to create, uh, working to create safeguards, um, like a daisy drive, which would force a gene drive to stop after a few generations. Um, and there's also the possibility for a reversal drive, which would basically overwrite the change made by the first drive. So if you don't like the effects of the change, you can, in theory, cancel it out. Um, so all that's great, uh, but there is still the risk that a country may simply decide to try a gene drive without worrying about those safeguards. Um, and even if we do have those safeguards, the technology basically still requires a conversation. What if Kenya wants to use a drive, but Tanzania doesn't? Who decides, how, who decides whether to release a gene drive that can fly? So this is where governments and NGOs will have a vital role to play. Um, first, by encouraging scientists to develop the safeguards and reversal drives. Um, and second, by honestly and openly weighing the risks and benefits. Um, and finally, I think, by carefully and transparently communicating um, those ideas and findings to the people who are going to be affected by it. And I'll say that um, this is not necessarily going to be easy. It's going well so far. But if the anti-vaccine movement in the United States um, at least has taught us anything, is that a lot of people are more likely to kind of trust their gut um, than to trust scientific studies. Uh, and you know, honestly, gene drives do have risks, at least in their current form, and they very much need to be discussed. But we also have diseases like malaria that are currently killing 1,000 people a day. And to combat them, we spray pesticides that do grave damage to other species. So it's quite possible that not using gene drives would be even more dangerous and foolish. And that's what we have to assess. Um, so I'm out of time now. But as a final point, I just want to note that this technology we think of as CRISPR um, is not static. It's obviously going to evolve and change. And just to give you some very recent series of examples, I can't even list them all, um, researchers recently created a new version of CRISPR that targets RNA rather than DNA. And that's big news because many diseases, including Huntington's disease and ALS, are caused not by a mutation in our DNA, but by a typo in our RNA. And other researchers have created a version of CRISPR that doesn't cut and paste genes, but simply turns them on and off using chemical signals. And that means we can now do something closer to epigenetic editing um, instead of just ordinary gene editing. So it's sort of giving us a volume control knob for genes, which is important because in some diseases, the problem isn't that a gene is you know, broken, producing the wrong protein. Maybe it's just producing too much of it or too little of it. Um, and already this technique has been used to cure both diabetes and muscular dystrophy in mice, of course, um, but still very promising. So in short, <laughs> CRISPR is uh, an extraordinary tool and like all extraordinary tools has benefits and risks. So going forward, probably our most important job as citizens and leaders will be to understand those potential impacts and kind of discuss them with intelligence and clarity, sadly lacking in the United States at the current moment, but hopefully doing better here in Europe. And whether or not we manage to do that well will we'll possibly literally determine our future. So thank you. I will first open for the audience. Are there any questions for Jennifer? Uh, in any case, I think it was a really interesting in the end with the different future applications. And one more that I was reading about recently was uh, using bacteriophages to target uh, bacteria uh, who, for antibiotic resistance, then, uh, which is also something that's really cool. So you're utilizing the system to retarget again, because normally it won't cut in the, in the bacteria's genome. Yeah. And now you use a bacteriophage to cut in the bacteria's genome by targeting the resistance gene and so on, tackle antibiotic resistance. So this is something that's really cool also. That's fantastic, yeah. Just as like, No, I love it, it's great, yeah. Uh, I can comment on, on that because it, it, it kind of touches on one of the questions that I, that I had for you, and this goes back to what Stefan Stoll was saying before. When, when next generation sequencing came, in, in 2000, mm -hmm. we, we knew that it was big, we knew that, uh, that it was a new technology, but we weren't really sure what, where it was going to go, or, or, or I guess you were talking about the human genome, right? We have the letters, but what, but what, what is going to come of all these letters? <laughs> and, and you didn't even know where you were standing. You, know, you look up and you, you don't know what you're looking at. What is the future of that? And I wonder if, if there's a certain similar feeling around CRISPR-Cas just now. Uh, where it's almost impossible to envision what it could be. So, I mean, we think yeah. that, we taught you, like you said at the end, these new technologies now where you can do epigenetics. I mean, in your, in your 
in, in your travels and the people you've met, the scientists you've talked to, is it that sort of feeling going on right now as, as well, that, that maybe we don't even know where we're going to be in a few years with this technology? Yeah, and I actually would love to hear um, people who've actually worked in the field through all these multiple revolutions. I'd love to hear what your experience is. My sense is that, well, I mean, you know, when I began looking into this, I thought um, sometimes genetics has a history of overpromising, right? So we, at least, you know, what gets out to the public is, oh my gosh, this is going to be great. We're going to be able to do, you know, gene therapy. And then it's that's coming around now, but it took a really long time, and there were a lot of failures, right? And so I think there was um, maybe more excitement or hype at various times. And so I was wondering whether this was going to be a similar case, where there was just going to be a lot of enthusiasm, and then it turned out to be much harder. Um, and I don't know. That may, that may still be true. But most folks I have talked to have said they think this is the real deal. They think this is going to really be transformative. Um, and obviously, there's going to be hurdles. Um, you know, like there's a number that have come up. But yeah, I think yeah. this is quite different. So I, I can say from my own knowledge that, that Targeted gene editing is not is not new. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, we've had these talons. Yeah. That maybe zinc you've heard these old the, the zinc finger yeah. nucleases. So, so I think that the concept. I'm speaking a little bit out of my comfort zone on this, but I think that the concept of doing precise gene editing is, is not new. Right. But like you said, the uh, the ease. The ease. Yeah. You know, and, and and also that myself, we've used CRISPR Cas in the lab. And there, it's completely free academic licensing. Yeah. You know, you order the plasmids from yeah. a repository, and for an academic, it's just been wonderful. It's easy to use, yeah. and it and it's free, and there's no hassle. You know, you sign an ND, uh, you sign a, an MTA, but it, it's a standard one. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that that is a difference with how freely it's been made available in academia, also that has helped the spread in, in research labs, from my own experience. And I will say they're building a lot. I'm not going to know these in detail, but I was just reading. I'm not going to be able to recall them, unfortunately. I was reading they're building a lot of additional tools um, you know, for human cell editing and for everything else. You can sort of send information, and you'll just get these kind of bespoke CRISPR um, you know, kind of like all, all you have to do is kind of you know like do a last little bit. I don't even remember what yeah, it is, yeah. but uh, you know it does ninety percent of the work for you, so you don't have all your grad students locked up in you know the lab all the time. Trying yes, to, you know, yeah. I think m maybe someone who works at SciLife Lab would know about this, <laughs> but but I, I do think that there was some talk of having CRISPR-based gene editing as a national platform mm. at SciLife Lab. Is it, am I off base totally here? I know it was discussed, but I don't think it, it came to any reality. But of course, it, it's a little bit like Bjorn and me, we were cloning gene fragments and sequencing them. We, now we don't do anything like that. We just ordered constructs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's likely that something like that would happen. And yeah. then if it's a natural platform or a not too expensive uh, zero or company that sells it. That's that's another yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, Bjorn. Uh, just a comment on one of the things you mentioned, Jennifer, on these horses that were outperforming other horses through the CRISPR. In World Anti-Doping Agency, they have started a panel oh. on on the CRISPR, and I'm also among other things. I'm also the chairman of the Swedish Track and Field Federation, and quite involved in anti-doping. Uh, the VADA. Uh, Headquarters is uh, localized in Montreal, and they have lots of resources, and they're currently <laughs> extremely worried about the utility of CRISPR-Cas9 and, and what you mentioned on the ability to turn genes on and off mm -hmm. to get maybe uh, erythropoietin produced uh, on and off because it's dangerous to have too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is a big field, and also the Karolinska Institute, that they're heavily involved actually on these panels currently. Mm -hmm. So that's already ongoing. A deep worry about how this can be applied in the sports field. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, even though there are limitations to what you can do with gene, so it's a gene doping panel. Fascinating. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear more about the gene therapy, gene doping. Yeah, yeah I mean, you say that it's, it's maybe not that the guy off the street can do CRISPR-Cas editing right, right now, but you know, the guy off the street can order a gene synthesis right now for a yeah. hundred euro. Yeah. There was a question, Sarah, over here. Yeah. I'm Sarah Quelling. I'm not uh, working at all with uh, CRISPR-Cas gene drive, but uh, of course it's connected these, it's a lot of ethical, um, it's going to be ethical debates and considerations and, and they're already ongoing. And I was just wondering who will be the drivers for these <laughs> ethical 
<laughs> debates and how, how will they be inclusive and how, how will it be open so so that it will be possible for everyone to come these are really enormous ethical debates that are ongoing and are coming in the future yes Thank and i i wish i had a better answer i mean i, I know that um uh one th good thing is that um I think people are more aware that they need to get out ahead of the problem. You know, GMOs became very controversial and so polarized, I think, in part because of the way that they were introduced. Um, and so, you know, it didn't feel very transparent and it didn't feel like, you know, the people who are going to be receiving these things, you know, had any say in them. Um, and so there is, you know, part of the um, malaria, anti-malaria you know, initiatives right now uh, strongly involve getting people who are, um, you know, in the countries that would be effective, you know, on board as, you know, participants and discussants. So it's not this kind of colonial effect of just, you know, we from the West have brought in our technology, now we're going to release it and, you know, good luck. Um, so that there are those initiatives at least out there, but I have yet to see, you know, a really concerted, organized, you know, I mean, everyone's talking about it, but it feels like the technology is moving so fast that, you know, there's currently sort of a, an agreement, oh, it's not time to release gene drives yet, but I mean, if someone, if someone in some country decides to release it, you know, what do we do? Um, so I, I think it's, you know, it's like much technology, it just, uh, you know. I can say that I think we will have a, a couple of presentations with experts oh. uh, ab about this type of topic, actually. Right. So I think that is a focus of this, this conference that we will hear more. Fantastic. Uh, Torborn, do you have something to ask? You raised it with doping. I mean, it's not only that it might be dangerous, but it might also be very difficult to assess whether it is positive or negative. I mean, one of the main arguments against doping in Sweden, the Swedish context at least, has to do with health problems. It's, it's dangerous itself. But it's also, of course, a resistance to the very fact that, that people improve their, their, their capacities through, as I say, unnatural or non-natural means then. But, but is that a bad thing? It wouldn't be fine if I could compete with, with the mm. top athletes in a safe manner. I think it's interesting that such questions are raised by this new technological yeah, development. Exactly. And I will return to some of the problems tomorrow. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, are there any non-GMO <laughs> re type related <laughs> questions? Uh, no, I'm just going to check my note to make sure I didn't have an extra one. I'm, I'm already disorganized here. but. I guess we can cover. Oh yeah, w w one last thing quickly. Uh, you, you you talk about the native population. We're mm. worried about the native population, but I, I, I guess I can also piggyback off Torbjorn then and say, should we be so worried about the native population really? Mm. I mean, isn't the native population going to get outcompeted at some point anyhow? We're oh. just helping it along. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, you know. Except I might say that there are two different things. So it's um, you know it's. Uh, I think it's partly the speed at which it happens, um, and also that you know it's not that Asian carp necessarily have something that is would outcompete them normally. But if you introduce a gene drive that forces, um, mm, for instance, okay. it to be only male carp, um, you're going to just force that population to die, yeah. and it's going to happen quite quickly. Yeah. Um, often before people suddenly realize something's going wrong and the carp are dying, and do you even have time to introduce a reversal drive? Um, and that could just, you know, be devastating if the country, for instance, you know, where, you know, depends on um, these fish as, you know, like a main source of protein or something like that. So I think that is, if there's a concern, that's the concern about the native population. I see. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So I think we close this session. We should thank Jennifer one more time. <laughs>